In this exclusive interview, he gives his detailed account of his employment with the Department of Naval Intelligence at the top secret facility known as S-4, where, according to Bob, he was hired to work on recovered alien spacecraft. S-4 is located 125 miles north of Las Vegas and 15 miles south of Groom Lake. This now not-so-secret military base at Groom Lake, Nevada, is known as Area 51, or Dreamland, as insiders like to call it. Born in 1959 in Coral Gables, Florida, Bob has lived much of his life in Las Vegas, Nevada. With degrees in physics and electronics from MIT and Caltech, he has dabbled in everything from chemistry to fireworks in an effort to understand the finer points of propulsion. He has even assembled a jet car with a 22,000 horsepower engine salvaged from a Navy F3D Sky Knight that is capable of land speeds of over 350 miles per hour. Fate took a serious turn for Bob in 1982. Arriving early for a lecture at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico given by Dr. Edward Teller, one of the inventors of the atomic bomb, Bob was able to meet and talk to the famous physicist. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was reading the local paper, The Monitor, with a featured front page article on Bob, and the two struck up a conversation. Later, Bob sent Dr. Teller his resume for consideration, and soon after, Bob was hired by the Los Alamos National Laboratory. This Los Alamos-based directory lists Bob as an employee. By 1989, Bob was brought into the top secret program at S4, known as Project Galileo. In the following interview, Bob reveals many details of this amazing experience. Did you witness any disk technology at Area 51? No, there was no, absolutely no ET craft, ET technology, anything like that at Area 51. This is why S-4 was made specifically to separate it there. People at Area 51 do not have the clearance. How long were you employed at S-4? And when were you hired? When was I hired at S4? I guess early 89. And I was probably there only about six months or so uh, on a very infrequent basis. How were you transported to and from work? At the time that I was working there at uh, McCarran International Airport in Las Vegas, there was a special projects EG&G building. When I was told to go to work, I drove there, parked my car there, uh, and got in a plane at the airport, flew to Groom Lake, where I deplaned and waited for a bus, and the bus drove me down to uh, S-4. The S-4 facility is an area just off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed, and it consists of nine hangars, the hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. Around the opposite end of the hangars, there's the standard entrance where you're dropped off at, go through a security check, and inside there's a small complex. Uh, there is some office space, there's several laboratories, the hangars themselves, of course, and uh, a few other places. I didn't have free reign to go wherever I wanted to. Everywhere I went to, I was essentially escorted, so uh, that was really all about that uh, I saw. Inside the facility, uh, what was the basic layout? Were there underground levels? I don't think there were any underground levels to it, though there, there could have been. I, I don't think it was uh, you know, an extensive underground facility. It just looked like uh, an installation that was butt up against a mountain. and. Uh, you know, I didn't see any evidence of any stairs going down, elevators, or, uh, but like I said, I don't know. There could have been, and I just might not have been permitted in those areas. It's difficult to, uh, to really surmise how long it had been operational. Everything did look fairly new. Uh, by that I mean I don't think this installation was there in the early 70s. Uh, nothing was worn. Uh, things look fairly freshly painted, so uh, you know, a as a ballpark guess, I would say it would it would really surprise me if the installation was older than five, seven, ten years, something like that. 
What agency is in charge of S4? Who controls the program? I was paid by the Department of Naval Intelligence, and what they're doing researching extraterrestrial craft is beyond me, but that's, that's where my checks came from, so I can only assume that uh, they were in charge of that. Did you see high-level government or military personnel at S-4? No, not at S-4. Anywhere in, in the overall facility at all? At Area 51, I believe. At Area 51, I believe I, I saw some military personnel, but uh, you know, no, no, no one I can identify or rank or, you know. Is this research confined to the U.S. government, or did you see any international involvement? At one time, the Russians were involved, and supposedly there was some breakthrough made by our team. However, this project was split up. And right after that happened, uh, the Russians were no longer permitted on the facility at all. And, uh, you know, that's, that's all I know about it. What was discovered, why they were kicked out, when they started working with us, is all unknown to me. You were hired to replace a scientist killed in the project. What exactly happened there? Allegedly, obviously, I, I didn't see this, and I don't know it to be fact, but this is what I was told, that I was hired uh, to replace one of a couple people that were killed uh, while working on one of the reactors from one of the crafts. Apparently, they, for whatever reason, cut open an operating reactor, and the device exploded, killing both of them. The scientists that were killed there, uh, allegedly the detonation from the explosion was fairly large. Uh, it would have rivaled a small tactical nuke. So it was done at the Nevada test site, and it was to be passed off as an un unannounced nuclear, nuclear test. Did you have any direct contact or communication with aliens? No, not at all. Tell us about the briefing files. Under what conditions did you gain access to them? I was put into the briefing room with uh, 121 or 22 briefings and really was just told to sit and read through them. I think they were there just to mainly educate me on, on what was going on. They weren't a complete in-depth in explanation on everything else, but just uh, essentially a brief synopsis on some of the other projects that were going on there. Supposedly, the information, now this isn't something that I determined, it's something I was told, that uh, the crafts originated from uh, a planet that orbited the Zeta Reticuli star system, Zeta Reticuli 1 and Zeta Reticuli 2, or two, two stars of a binary star system. Uh, the craft allegedly came from there. One or two autopsy photographs I saw uh, dealt with just a small photograph, a bus shot essentially, just head, shoulders, and chest of an alien with a uh, uh, chest was cut open in a T fashion and one single organ was removed. Uh, the organ itself in the, in the other picture was uh, cut and vivisectioned essentially, the, uh, showing the different chambers in there. Uh, this was totally unrelated to anything I was doing, but from that photograph it looked like what you see in UFO lore as the typical gray. So how tall it was from what I could see, I, I couldn't tell because I only saw a portion of the photograph. But if everything else you see is correct, I would imagine it was three and a half or four feet tall. But uh, there again, you know, all I had to see was a photograph and, you know, I didn't have much to go on. You mentioned these beings have historically interacted with man. How? What was involved there? Allegedly, this interaction has occurred since, you know, man was a simian creature and, uh, you know, there were genetic alterations made. How specifically did the briefings detail how the aliens manipulated our genetics over the centuries? It mentioned 65 or 63 uh, corrections or additions to the genetic makeup uh, that finally resulted in you know, a, a human creature. In an earlier interview, you had mentioned you saw what you thought may be an alien. Was it an alien? What did you see? What I had said and all that occurred was I was walking by a door, uh, a door that had a small 9 by 9 
window in it, little wires running through it, and glanced in there and there were two uh, either technicians, scientists, or whoever they were, looking down at something. And what that something was caught my eye and I never really did see what it was. A lot of people have asserted, well, there was an alien and there are aliens working around there and so on and so forth. I mean, I, I don't think that was the case. But uh, who knows? I was, you know, you're seeing all these fantastic things and your mind gets going and, you know, you catch something out of the corner of your eye, who knows what your mind's going to come up with. So I, I certainly wouldn't stand on that as fact by any means. What was the incident in 1979 that brought the alien exchange program of information to a halt? Again, this is a story that was relayed to me. And uh, allegedly what happened in 79, there was some sort of information exchange going on where there were actual live aliens at the facility. And at one particular point, there was an area where some security personnel went to enter. And apparently because of not the sidearms, but the bullets in the sidearms, from what I understand, if they would have entered the area, the bullets would have detonated. Uh, and supposedly one of the creatures tried to stop the security personnel from entering the area, and a fight ensued. And the bottom line from the altercation was that the uh, security personnel, I don't remember how many were involved, but were all killed and they died of head wounds and that's all that all that I heard of that story. What was your job description at S4? My official job description was a st senior staff physicist. Uh, I don't know if I actually had that position when I was there because I was there so infrequently I wasn't supervising anyone so I uh, that, that was the official position I was hired under but uh, whether or not I actually acted in that capacity, I don't know. What was the size of the staff working on Project Galileo? Well, there were 22 people employed there totally. And that was specifically for the Galileo project? No, for the entire project. Oh, I see. There were 22 people with majestic clearance. I had majestic clearance. Majestic clearance was designated as uh, clearance 38 levels above Q clearance, and Q clearance is the civilian uh, top secret clearance. When did you see your first disc? The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second, or I, I think it was the third time I was up there. Uh, normally the bus pulled around to the opposite end of the facility, which was the main entrance, and that's where we went in. On um, this particular occasion, it pulled up to one of the hangar doors, which were normally closed and the, the last one was open, we came out and I saw the disc in the hangar. Uh, upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years and, you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And uh, it never even occurred to me, even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle, that you know, this wasn't man-made. When did you realize the craft was not of earthly origin? Well, it probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole, as what we were doing, the fact that we weren't building this thing. We were trying to find out how it was made. We were back engineering it. What is back engineering? Well, back engineering is taking a finished product and finding out how the device or product was produced and essentially determining whether or not you can duplicate it. Now, scientists aside, what was your emotional response? What were you thinking were the implications to the world or man in general from these revelations? I really didn't think about implications of, of, of that sort. As far as emotionally, uh, people have asserted that, boy, that must have been the most exciting time in your life. And I, that's not the way it was. When I first got to look inside the craft, the, the, all I can say, it's an ominous feeling. You walk in there and uh, it's, 
it feels as if you shouldn't be there. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's a real ominous feeling. It's not an exciting feeling. Uh, it brings up a whole lot of questions in your mind. Well, where did this come from? And you know that they won't give you the answers to the whole story, but it's, uh, that's the only way I can describe it. How many craft are housed at S4? And are they, in fact, all dish-shaped? There are nine, and their shapes vary. I only got to do a close inspection on one of them. Uh, the others I just briefly saw, and they, they pretty much varied. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking and I gave it the name the sport model. Um, there was one that looked like a jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Uh, there was a disc that was turned up on its side and it had a large projectile hole with the metal bent outwards on it. Uh, I can only surmise they were testing it to see if a uh, you know, projectile could penetrate it. Of course, it's just a guess on my part. But for the most part, they were pretty, pretty varied. How many times did you enter the disc, or did you only enter the sport model? I only entered the sport model. The other ones, I wasn't uh, allowed to loiter around, to go near, really even to look at. I just, at one point, walking through the hangar doors, all the bay doors between all the hangars were open, and I got a, a glimpse all the way down uh, of the whole corridor. But that was the only time it was ever open. Tell us about the lower level of the craft where the gravity generators are located. The lower level of the craft, the floor itself is hexagonal, little hexagonal squares. And the hatch, or if you want to call it a hatch, the access way to get in there is an ingenious little assembly. It's a honeycomb structure. And if you put your fingers in one end of the honeycomb and push, all the honeycombs will collapse in on each other, making a hole. It's kind of a neat, uh, a neat doorway, something that we could, you know, use, I, I don't know what for, but I mean, it's, it, it's something that I haven't seen before, and it, it's kind of a novel idea. But a very efficient, lightweight, very strong uh, access way. Uh, I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower... Uh, the lower level, essentially. And there were three large gravity amplifiers. These devices looked like about a two-foot diameter, four-foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above, and they can be independently positioned. Uh, and that's what, what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft. The second level was the only other level that I was on. It was the main level. Uh, that contained the reactor where the seating was, the gravity amplifiers themselves, though we also called the devices that hung down on the lower level the gravity amplifiers because they were really one and the same. They were probably the waveguides or horns, if you want to relate that to microwaves. Um, and really, that's about it. That's all that was on that level. So it's assumed this was not made for a human pilot. It would be extremely inconvenient for a human pilot. Humans really can't even function in there the, because of the ceiling clearance. Uh, the seats were so tiny. Uh, it was obviously made for a creature much smaller than a human. How does the craft achieve lift? It produces a gravity wave, which is similar to the gravity wave that the Earth produces. However, the craft phase shifts the wave. In other words, it, it turns the wave not really in an opposite polarity, but something to that effect, where it will work against the natural gravity wave of the Earth, and it produces a lift in, in that effect. Is there any internal protection for the crew? Does the craft generate a, a, a gravitational field inside the craft itself? Well, the craft generates its own gravitational field. Being inside that field, essentially doesn't shield you, but it, essentially you're in, <laughs> and this is a, a terrible way to say it, almost in a different realm, because you're, you're now influenced only the, by that gravitational field. For instance, people wonder how a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed, a 90-degree turn. 
when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect. Well, that, that really wouldn't happen. Inertia would have no effect. Uh, you're, you're in a distortion. And don't forget that gravity distorts time and space. So really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there. Describe the gravity amplifiers for us and some of their different operating configurations. There are three amplifiers. The craft can operate on a single one, can lift off the ground. The way in which it's propelled are two different ways. There's what they call Omicron configuration, where the craft is using one generator, uh, or Delta configuration, where it's utilizing all three. Delta configuration would be for space travel. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, as opposed to a science fiction movie where you see a flying saucer moving around. The craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. Moving around the source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference, essentially. So what they do is they work with that interference to their benefit. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward. The crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity, two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill and the craft rolls downhill for infinity. It's always chasing a little distortion. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed, because they're essentially, and any time you run over, you know, the gravity field around the Earth is not completely constant and stable, depending on the minerals and density of the Earth underneath it. The gravity will vary somewhat, and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is is kind of unstable for the most part. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. Uh, the test was going off probably, you know, uh, just as the sun was going down. And it was a, a low performance test. I believe there were uh, some pilots or test pilots in the craft. The craft must have been retrofitted to fit them because the seating arrangements were really not accommodating. Um, they were in radio communication with the craft, which is kind of surprising to me because the gravity waves that the craft was producing should have uh, distorted the radio waves also. So uh, apparently there's something there that I don't understand. Um, the craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. That dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. However, that was an extremely impressive test. Uh, maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything, that, that wouldn't be a whole lot, but you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter. I don't know exactly how much it weighed, but it weighed a lot. And uh, this was quite, quite a scientific feat to lift something completely silently under control, and uh, you know perform a maneuver like. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal. It was cold to the touch. That's why I say it was metal. But it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. Had no seams. It was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. When you're on the outside, you know, you, you pretty much think, you know, how could they keep something like this secret? It's a crime against science, it's a crime against the people and, and all that, but you know, y your feelings change once you're privy to the information. Once I was inside, I mean, there was kind of a bit of selfishness, you know, it's, well, I know about it now, this is great, you know, we should keep it secret just so we all know about it. And, you know, that really does go through your mind, though after a while it wears off, but, uh, you know, you felt privileged to be privy to the information. How would you define gravity? 
Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there, these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science, current science right now, identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research at S4 or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale, on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most, most familiar with, uh, holding planets in orbit holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. How are vast distances of space traveled by amplifying a gravitational field? Well, because space, time, and gravity are all interrelated, if you could produce gravity artificially, an extremely intense field of gravity, what you could do is actually distort the distance between two objects and make it shorter. Not just distorting the distance, but now you're also decreasing the time, the actual time between the two places. So you're not traveling in a linear mode like flying a spacecraft from point A to point B. You're, you've actually modified the time and the space that you travel in. So you're now traversing a huge amount of distance with little time, and actually with traveling little distance. As crazy as it seems, that, that's what's going on. What are some of the inherent problems with traveling at the speed of light? There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster, begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. 
Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam uh, configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device using the uh, gravity generator. And Project Looking Glass? Project Looking Glass dealt with the distortion, the fact that there's a time distortion. Essentially, looking back in time, and by that I do not mean looking back years ago to see the wagon train days, they're looking for distortions that are milliseconds in time, and what what that was used for, I, I don't know, but that was uh, just observing the time, the, you know, the time distortion, time dilation phenomena, of the craft in operation. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the Heavy Ion Research Lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring. You know. uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided, through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, Elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that, but uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us 
I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere, you know, anyone can speculate. But I was I was told that was the the figure. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. You witnessed several nighttime test flights unofficially while off the base. What did you see? The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends who I had brought out there. I, at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers, I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect. But I missed some of the most uh, impressive maneuvers. But the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up other than the fact that it went above the mountain range uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed. How were you able to find out about the test flight schedules? The test flight schedules were told to me uh, specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times and at that time the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights and from what they said that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area and that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft but uh, as far as there being an exhaust there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up what you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a, really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light, the same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolt. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers. Tell us a little more about the aurora you witnessed taking off out of Area 51. When I was leaving the uh, Area 51 facility heading down to S4 there was a tremendous roar and I have described it as uh, the sound like the sky was tearing and I couldn't see out the windows of the bus, all I can see out was the, the very front. And as we came by, I asked Dennis, who was my supervisor and on the bus at that time, he said what that was. He said it was an Aurora, a high altitude research plane. And um, it was a large craft. And the one glimpse I got of it was from the rear. And it had two huge square exhausts with vanes in them. And uh, it was just I, it sounded more like a rocket than a jet. I don't know. I even think he did mention that it was liquid methane powered. But um, there again, you know, working on the disk technology, I really could care less what was rolling around at Area 51. But uh, it, it, it did catch my eye. As a result of going public, have there been any attempts made on your life? One day when I was getting on um, Interstate 15, driving down Charleston Boulevard, uh, a car came up alongside of me and uh, I thought he was just trying to race me to get on the freeway. Uh, this was after I had left the project. Um, it was a white boxy looking car, exactly what make and model, I don't know. But um, I accelerated to get on the freeway to go fast and there was a gunshot and the back of the car was hit and I skidded off into the uh, median 
and I stopped and I was frightened and I just stood there because I thought the guy was going to be alongside of me and just shoot me. I had nothing to do. I was essentially paralyzed with, with fear and I waited there and then nothing else happened. And do I know it was a government agent trying to kill me? No. Could it have been a drive-by shooting? Maybe. Uh, you know, so... Was it, I mean, it was an attempt on my life, but by who specifically, I, I don't know. Though I was threatened uh, before I had left, that they threatened my wife's life and my life, so I can only put two and two together and say that they were kind of pissed at me. In an earlier interview, you had mentioned that they had put a gun to your head. Tell us about that. That was after we were caught out when I had the test flight schedule, and uh, I brought some friends out to show them the disc test. Uh, we got caught out there and the following day I was debriefed down at Indian Springs Air Force Base and um, I was in the room with the security guards that caught us, my supervisor and some other people and uh, some of the security personnel. Uh, yeah, they were essentially grilling me about security and how could I possibly bring people out there and uh, I guess I wasn't as responsive as they would like and they got in my face and one of them pulled a sidearm out and, you know just pushed. Have you maintained any contacts with your colleagues out at S4? No I never heard from anyone other than for a very brief time after I left Dennis who was my supervisor did try and make contact with me at the uh, the meeting place was the Union Plaza Hotel, and I took a, a friend of mine, Gene Huff, down there, and another friend, uh, a former colleague and scientist from Los Alamos. And we did, uh, we saw him, but I also did recognize some security personnel walking around there from S4. So whether or not it was a setup or what was going on or was trying to talk to me, we never found out and we left. It just was a, a real strange situation. I never heard from him since. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed, uh, I would say considerably. Before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the, uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Um, I even remember before I was involved there, a friend showed me a little newspaper clipping and said John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. And uh, I was also under the impression that, you know, boy, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know they're out here to protect us and all that. You know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government <laughs> is doing everything but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking out is for themselves. You know, uh, obviously the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. Actual crafts and technology from another world. And uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality in my mind. And uh, it really just, I guess, opened my eyes. The big thing is whether or not we can duplicate them. I mean, if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is, that's great. But if we can't duplicate it, it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at and then once we understand it is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology and you know unless we've got a handle on both of them all that technology is useless to us and if it turns out we can't do that, all we have is one single prized possession that we have to take care of, and that's it. After all that's been said and done, would you do this over again? What would you do differently? 
I would probably have played along for a longer time. Um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that. You know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems, but um, I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on propulsion or field propulsion or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But, um, you know, if they turned it over to the scientific community and not just a couple guys here in the United States, I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there, uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the security itself that prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that where you work in isolated groups and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere and that's, that's the problem they have. What does the future hold for Bob Lazar? Well, I'm not really involved in any of that stuff anymore. That's kind of put behind me. Um, I have my own businesses that I work at, uh, some computer graphics, uh, some consultation, um, other technical jobs, uh, radiation detectors and a few other things like that. Um, so really, I just go about my life, and that's you know something that happened that was fantastic, and and it's over. But uh, it's kind of hard to shake it loose. But eventually, I will, and that'll be that. I think all the surveillance and everything stopped. I don't think anyone's bothering to monitor me. I've, I've said everything that I know. It's been all over the place, so it's kind of uh, a done deal. As far as whether or not there are any craft out there, I believe. You know, they were out and gone in probably the late 89, early 90. And the only thing people see now out there are, you know, either flares or planes coming into land. But uh, that's about it. Did you have an interest in flying saucers or science fiction in general as a child? I was never interested in flying saucers as a child. Science fiction, you know, I watched Star Trek, I guess, with everyone else back then. But uh, for the most part, yeah, I didn't even believe in flying saucers up until I was employed at S4. Hi, I'm Bob Lazar. During late 1988 and early 89, I worked on the propulsion systems of extraterrestrial vehicles for the United States government. The hardware and technology I was exposed to should be placed in the proper hands of the scientific community, and it is the right of every person on Earth to know that there is physical evidence which proves that there is life elsewhere and that at least one form of that life has been here. For those of you whose information about me is limited to this video, I'll give you a brief background. I'm a physicist. I have degrees in physics and electronics technology. I worked in a number of scientific programs, some of which require top secret and above top secret security clearances, of which the most easily verifiable is my early 1980s job here at the Los Alamos Maison Physics Facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Between December of 88 and April of 89, I worked as a senior staff physicist in what has to be the most secret project in history. My place of work was a facility at an area known as S-4 on the Nellis Air Force Range in central Nevada. Area S-4 is located approximately 15 miles south of the infamous Area 51 installation at Groom Lake, where the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes were developed. For the duration of my employment at S-4, I was paid by the United States Navy. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to segregate the information contained here into two separate parts. 
The first part will deal with information with which I've had hands-on experience and personal instruction. In other words, not only did I read briefings and not only was I taught the theories of these technologies, but they were demonstrated for me and I know they are true and accurate. Some of the points covered in this first section will be how vast distances of space are traveled by virtue of an intense gravitational field, how this gravitational field is generated, what the power source is and how it functions, and general information about disks and the project at S4. The second part of this will deal with subjects on which I've read supporting information, yet for the most part, I had no other way to corroborate the information or ascertain its accuracy. When we get to part two, it'll be obvious why proof of some of this information could not be conclusive. Some of the points covered in this second section will be information about the beings that brought us this technology and how these beings have historically interacted with man. I've been prudent in selecting what to expose here, and I think that some of this information should not be made available to the general public. This information is being conveyed to you as it was to me, with the exception that in most cases I've simplified things for those of you with non-scientific and non-technological backgrounds. So let's begin. At the beginning of this first section, I'm going to give you three short science lessons, and once you've learned them, You'll not only know more about interstellar travel than almost anyone else in the world, but you'll know the actual method another civilization has used to travel from another star system to the planet Earth. Now during the course of this, I'm going to have to relate information that I've learned at S4 to information that we're already aware of. And when I say we, I mean the general mainstream scientific community. So it's not to waste too much time explaining established scientific facts and theories. When I say we know this or we know that, please feel free to consult any qualified scientist, professor, or science teacher to have them explain my statements to you. One of the most predominantly asked questions is, how is it possible to cross vast expanses of space without exceeding the speed of light? Or how can you travel in reasonable time and economy between points that are light years apart? Now keep in mind that the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second, which translates into roughly 669 million miles an hour. And a light year is a distance traveled in one year at the speed of light. Proxima Centauri, which is the star system nearest ours, would take four years to reach traveling at the speed of light. So up until now, when we've examined the requirements to travel these distances, we've always had to consider the problems of traveling at a speed near the speed of light. This poses problems with propulsion, navigation, fuel capacities, and even when you consider the effects of acceleration on space-time, which include time dilation, mass increase, length contraction, and a whole host of other things, it quickly becomes evident that this type of travel would require a level of technology that man has not yet achieved. The truth of the matter is that traveling these distances does require a level of technology that man has not yet achieved. But it has nothing to do with flying in a linear mode near the speed of light. We know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, so in our universe we've always assumed that the fastest way from point A to B was to travel in a straight line at the speed of light. Well, the fact is that when you're dealing with space-time and you enjoy the capability of generating an intense gravitational field, the fastest way from point A to B is to distort or warp or bend the space-time between point A and B, bringing point A and B closer together. The more intense the gravitational field, the greater the distortion of space-time and the shorter the distance between points A and B. Most of us think of space-time as the void or as nothing. And remember, it wasn't that long ago that man considered the air in our atmosphere to be nothing. Yet with time, we've become aware of the elements and properties of the air in our atmosphere. Well, indeed, space-time is an entity, and one of its properties is that it can be distorted or bent by a gravitational field. We know that gravity bends or distorts space, time, and light by virtue of the fact that we're able to see stars which we know should be blocked from our view by the sun. Referring to the graphic here, the solid line denotes the position of a star that's located behind the sun, and the dotted line shows its position as viewed from Earth. This is made possible because the sun's gravitational field distorts the space, time, and light around the sun, allowing us to view stars which would be hidden from view. 
We know that gravity distorts time by virtue of the fact that if we take two identical atomic clocks and keep one at sea level and take the other one up to a high altitude, when we bring them both back together, they reflect different times. The difference in this passage of time is caused by the fact that a gravitational field weakens the further you get from the source. So the atomic clock which was taken to the high altitude was exposed to a less powerful gravitational field than the clock which we kept at sea level. The effect of a gravitational field on space-time is something that we've been able to observe but not to experiment with. This is due to our inability to generate a gravitational field. And up until this point in time, great mass such as a star, planet, or moon was the only source of a discernible gravitational field that we're aware of. So just as the gravitational field around great mass such as a planet distorts space and time, any gravitational field, whether naturally occurring or generated, distorts space and time in a similar manner. Now the great benefit of generating an intense gravitational field is not only can you turn it on, but you can turn it off. If we refer back to our original illustration of space-time distortion, we can see that when we generate an intense gravitational field, we can distort the space-time and in turn the distance between the point where we are and the point where we want to be. We can then position ourselves at the point where we want to be and then stop generating the gravitational field, allowing space-time to return to its natural form. In this manner, we can travel great distances with little linear movement and this is how space-time distortion translates into reduced distance. Now back to our original question, how is it possible to cross the vast expanses of space required for interstellar travel without exceeding the speed of light? This is accomplished by generating an intense gravitational field, distorting space-time and allowing you to cross many light years of space in little or no time and without traveling in a linear mode near the speed of light. The next question is, how do you generate a gravitational field? Up until this point in time, I've used the term generate to describe the capability of producing a gravitational field, but since I'm not aware of any way of creating a gravitational field from nothing, a more accurate term might be to access and amplify a gravitational field. And this is what I mean when I use the term generate. To understand how gravity is generated or accessed and amplified, you must first know what gravity is. There are two main theories the wave theory which states that gravity is a wave, and the currently accepted theory of gravitons, which are alleged subatomic particles that perform as, as gravity, which is total nonsense. Well, gravity is a wave, and there are two specific different types of gravity, gravity A and gravity B. Gravity A works on a smaller micro scale, while gravity B works on a larger macro scale. We are familiar with gravity B. It is the big gravity wave that holds the Earth as well as the rest of the planets in orbit around the Sun and holds the Moon as well as man-made satellites in orbit around the Earth. We are not familiar with gravity A. It is the small gravity wave which is the major contributory force that holds together the mass that makes up all protons and neutrons. Gravity A is what is currently being labeled as the strong nuclear force in mainstream physics, and gravity A is the wave that you need to access and amplify in it to enable you to cause space-time distortion for interstellar travel. To keep them straight, just remember that gravity A works on an atomic scale, and gravity B is the big gravity wave that works on a stellar or planetary level. However, don't mistake the size of these waves for their strength, because gravity A is a much stronger force than gravity B. You can momentarily break the gravity B field of the Earth simply by jumping in the air. So this is not an intense gravitational field. Locating gravity A is no problem because it is found in the nucleus of every atom of all matter here on Earth and all matter anywhere else in our universe. However, accessing gravity A with the naturally occurring elements found on Earth is a big problem. Actually, I'm not aware of any way of accessing the gravity A wave using any Earth elements whether naturally occurring or synthesized, and here's why. We've already learned that gravity A is the major force that holds together the mass that makes up protons and neutrons. This means the gravity A wave we are trying to access is virtually inaccessible as it is located within matter, or at least within the matter that we have here on Earth. However, the Earth is not representative of all matter within our universe. The residual matter which remains after the creation of a solar system is totally dependent on the contributing factors which were present during the creation of the solar system. This is true whether you believe that the origin of the universe was an evolutionary event 
or that a supreme being caused this event to happen. The two main factors which determine what residual matter remains after the creation of a solar system are the amount of electromagnetic energy and the amount of mass present during the solar system's creation. Our solar system has one star, which is our sun, but the majority of solar systems in our Milky Way galaxy are binary and multiple star systems. In fact, many single star systems have stars that are so large that our sun would appear to be a dwarf by comparison. Keeping all this in mind, it should be obvious that a large single star system, binary star system, or multiple star system would have had more of the prerequisite mass and electromagnetic energy present during their creations. This makes it possible for these systems to possess elements which are not native to the Earth. Scientists have long theorized that there are potential combinations of protons and neutrons which should provide stable elements with atomic numbers higher than any which appear in our periodic chart though none of these heavy elements occur naturally on Earth. 88 of the first 92 elements on the periodic chart occur naturally on Earth. Some heavier elements do occur in trace amounts, but for the most part, we synthesize these heavier elements in laboratories. Generally speaking, the stability of these synthesized heavy elements decreases as their atomic number increases. But experiments at the lab for heavy ion research in Germany have shown that this may only be true up to a certain point, as the half-life for element 109 is longer than that of element 108. The point is that our observations and theories are accurate. The fact is that heavier stable elements with higher atomic numbers which have more protons, neutrons, and electrons than any Earth elements do exist. However, up until this point in history, there has been no physical evidence to prove this. But now that proof is here. The most important attribute of these heavier stable elements is that the gravity A wave is so abundant that it actually extends past the perimeter of the atom. These heavier stable elements literally have their own gravity A field around them in addition to the gravity B field that is native to all elements. No naturally occurring atoms on Earth have enough protons and neutrons for the cumulative gravity A wave to extend past the perimeter of the atom so you can access it. Even though the distance that the gravity A wave extends is infinitesimal, it is accessible and it has amplitude, wavelength, and frequency just like any other wave in the electromagnetic spectrum. Once you can access the gravity A wave, you can amplify it just like we amplify any other electromagnetic wave. To demonstrate how a wave is amplified, we can use this oscilloscope. And as you can see, it graphically depicts the tone you hear as a wave. As we amplify the tone, you can see that the size or the amplitude of the wave increases giving us a more powerful version of the same identical wave, and thus the tone sounds louder. In like manner, the gravity A wave is amplified and then focused on the desired destination to cause the space-time distortion required for space travel. This amplified gravity A wave is so powerful that the only naturally occurring source of gravity that could cause space-time to distort this much would be a black hole. This brings us back to our original question. How do you generate a gravitational field? You must have access to an element which is heavy enough for the gravity A wave to extend past the perimeter of the atom. Then you can access and amplify it for space-time distortion. To complete our three science lessons, the last question is, what is the power source for this type of travel? Well, for those of you with limited knowledge about power sources, I'm sure you can probably imagine the enormous amount of power required to cause a space-time distortion for this type of travel. After all, we're amplifying a wave that barely extends past the perimeter of an atom until it's large enough to distort vast amounts of space-time. For those of you with extensive knowledge about power sources, I'm sure it's probably even more puzzling as to how it's possible to have a compact, lightweight, onboard power source that can provide this much power. For everyone to understand that, I need to further explain a couple of things we briefly touched upon in the last question. If you remember, I said that for the most part, we synthesize or create heavier elements in accelerators and their stability decreases as their atomic number increases. So what does this all mean? Well, we synthesize these heavier, unstable elements by using more stable elements as targets in a particle accelerator. We then bombard the target element with various atomic and subatomic particles. At this point, transmutation occurs, making the target element a different, heavier element. 
This element now has a higher atomic number as the atomic number simply indicates the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So this is what I mean when I say their atomic number increases. What does their stability decreases mean? The length of time which an element exists before it decays determines its stability. Atoms of some elements decay faster than atoms of other elements, so the faster an element decays, the more unstable that element is considered to be. When an atom decays, it releases or radiates subatomic particles and energy, which is the radiation that a Geiger counter detects. As you can see, this Geiger counter is detecting the radiation from this uranium, which literally means that the Geiger counter is sensing the subatomic particles which are being released or radiated as the uranium decays. Those elements in which nuclear radiation can be consistently detected are radioactive elements. These heavy elements, which we synthesize in particle accelerators, are of the radioactive variety and they decay very rapidly. Since we're only able to make a few atoms of these elements, and because they decay so rapidly, we're not able to observe much about them. This is what I mean when I say their stability decreases. However, there are elements with higher atomic numbers which are stable, even though they don't occur naturally on Earth, and we can synthesize them in particle accelerators. These are the elements in the 114, 115 range, which don't appear on our periodic chart. Beyond element 115, the elements become unstable again, and in fact, element 116 decays in fractions of a second. This finally brings us to the power source. The power source is a reactor which uses this element 115 as its fuel. In this reactor, element 115 is used as a target and is bombarded with protons in a small particle accelerator. When a proton plugs into the nucleus of an atom of 115, it increases its atomic number and becomes an atom of element 116, which, remember, decays instantly. What element 116 releases as it decays, or what it radiates, is antimatter. What is antimatter? Antimatter is the exact counterpart of matter, which has a charge and a spin that is in the opposite of all matter. When combined with any matter in our universe, antimatter reacts and completely converts to energy. And remember, the rapid conversion of matter to energy is what we generally call an explosion. To demonstrate the explosive power of antimatter, let's pick a random area where an atomic bomb might explode. Oh, let's say Iraq. And for demonstration purposes, let's say an atomic bomb would explode, for instance, in, uh, oh, Baghdad. Well, if one of our older atomic bombs exploded in Baghdad, the area of total devastation, which is indicated by the red dot on the map, would be approximately two miles. This would be caused by a fission reaction in which less than 1% of the nuclear material is converted to energy. Most of you are familiar with the bombs that were dropped on Japan in World War II. This is the same bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, August 9, 1945. About this same time, Dr. Edward Teller, who's known as the father of the hydrogen bomb, figured out that a nuclear fusion bomb was possible. Fusion would release even more energy and cause an even bigger explosion from the same amount of nuclear material. Much to Dr. Teller's dismay, the Japanese surrendered, we never dropped the hydrogen bomb, and Dr. Teller's been in a bad mood ever since. But if a hydrogen bomb containing the same amount of nuclear material as the Nagasaki bomb were to explode in Baghdad, the area of total devastation would be approximately 20 miles. This would be caused by a nuclear fusion reaction, which again, less than 1% of the nuclear material actually converts to energy or explodes. The other 99% of the nuclear material on this type of bomb is dispersed, but is not involved in the actual nuclear fusion reaction. Now, if a bomb was made with the same amount of nuclear material as the Nagasaki bomb, and that material was antimatter, when that bomb exploded in Baghdad, the area of total devastation would include parts of Africa, Europe, and Asia, with the exact area of total devastation being very difficult to calculate. This would be caused by a total annihilation reaction, which is the complete conversion of matter to energy. A hundred percent of the nuclear material on this bomb would explode or convert to energy. We currently have no practical way to harness antimatter into a bomb, and generally speaking, we can only isolate antimatter in a particle accelerator and store it for a short time. This demonstrates the enormous amount of power released when you totally convert matter to energy, which is what happens when antimatter and matter are combined. 
So back to our power source. Inside the reactor, element 115 is bombarded with a proton, which plugs into the nucleus of the 115 atom and becomes element 116, which immediately decays and releases or radiates small amounts of antimatter. The antimatter is released in a vacuum into a tuned tube, which keeps it from reacting with the matter that surrounds it. It is then directed towards a gaseous matter target at the end of the tube. The matter and antimatter collide and annihilate, totally converting to energy. The heat from this reaction is converted into electrical energy in a near 100% efficient thermoelectric generator. This is a device that converts heat directly into electrical energy. Many of our satellites and space probes use thermoelectric generators, but their efficiency is very, very low. All of these actions and reactions inside of the reactor are orchestrated perfectly like a tiny little ballet. And in this manner, the reactor provides an enormous amount of power. So back to our original question. What is the power source that provides the power required for this type of travel? The power source is a reactor which uses element 115 as a fuel and uses a total annihilation reaction to provide the heat which it converts to energy, making it a compact, lightweight, efficient onboard power source. I've got a couple of quick comments about element 115 for those of you who are interested. By virtue of the way it's used in the reactor, it depletes very slowly, and only 223 grams of 115, which is just under half a pound, can be utilized for a period of 20 to 30 years. Element 115's melting point is 1740 degrees Celsius. I need to state here that even though I had hands-on experience with element 115, I didn't melt any of it down, and I didn't use any of it for 20 to 30 years to see if it depleted. So we've learned how space-time is distorted by a gravitational field, We've learned how that gravitational field is generated, and we've also learned where you get the power to accomplish all of this. Now it's time to link all we've learned in our science lessons to the vehicle that utilizes all of this technology. And a few years ago, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but that vehicle is a disc, which is generally referred to as a flying saucer. I had at least partial views of the nine different discs out at Area S4, but the one I'm going to describe to you now is the one in which I not only saw two of the three interior levels, but I also saw it fully functional in flight. And no, unfortunately, I didn't get to go for a ride in it. This particular disc appeared to be in excellent condition and because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The exterior skin of the disc is metal, which is the color of unpolished stainless steel. The sport model sits on its belly when it's not energized. As you can see, the hatch is located on the upper half of the disc with just the bottom portion of the door wrapping around the center lip of the disc. The interior level of the disc is divided into three levels. The lower level is where the three gravity amplifiers and amplifier guides are located. These are the things used to amplify and focus the gravity A wave that we learned about in our science lessons. The reactor is located directly above the three gravity amplifiers on the center level and is in fact centered between them. The reactor is similar to this half-scale model. The element 115 is machined into triangles like this and is then inserted into the reactor. This piece of element 115 is the source of the gravity A wave as well as the target that is bombarded with protons to release the antimatter, both of which we learned about in our science lessons. The center level of this disc also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. The walls of the center level are all divided into archways. At one point in time, when the disc was energized, one of the archways became transparent and you could see the area outside of it just as if the archway was a window. After the panel had been transparent for a while, a form of writing, which was unlike any alphabetic, scientific, or mathematical symbols I've ever seen, began to appear on the transparent archway. And I was never informed as to how all of this was achieved, not that any of that would have required alien technology. I was never given access to the upper level of the disk, so I can't enlighten you as to what the porthole-like areas are, other than I can assure you that they're not portholes. Now, before I go any further about the disk, I'm going to show you where and under what circumstances I saw it tested. My job in this program was to be part of a back engineering team. Back engineering is the act of taking a finished product and tearing it apart to find out what makes it tick. The goal in this program was to see if the technology of the disk could be duplicated with earth materials. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51, which is a highly secure government base on the Nevada test site. 
Area 51 is located about 125 miles north of Las Vegas near the Groom Mountains and the Groom Dry Lake Bed. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S4. S4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The airspace around S4 is restricted and if any unwelcome aircraft strays into the outer sector, they radio the pilot and instruct him or her to leave. If that pilot continues and strays into the middle sector, jets will be scrambled to escort the intruding aircraft out. If for any reason whatsoever that aircraft penetrates into the inside sector before jets can be airborne, ground-to-air missiles will neutralize the intruder. The moral of this story is don't try and fly into S-4. The S-4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. As you can see in this representation, my ID badge had a white background with one light blue and one dark blue diagonal stripe in the upper left hand corner. At the bottom of the badge, there were letters and numbers designating various areas including S-4. On my badge, there was a star punch through S-4. The back of the ID badge was dark blue with a vertical mag stripe running down one side. The hangar that housed the sport model was like a typical airplane hangar with the exception of the angled doors that I mentioned before. The hangar was equipped with typical tools and extensive electronic equipment. It also had a machine with an x-ray emblem on it and an overhead crane rated at 20,000 pounds. Equipment in this hangar was marked with a black number 41 with a white circle around it. It was outside of this hangar that I saw the sport model tested. Now when the disk travels near another source of gravity, such as a planet or moon, it doesn't use the same mode of travel that we learned about in our science lessons. When a disk is near another source of gravity, like Earth, the gravity A wave, which propagates outward from the disk, is phase shifted into the gravity B wave, which propagates outward from the Earth, and this creates lift. The gravity amplifiers of the disk can be focused independently and they are pulsed and do not stay on continuously. When all three of these amplifiers are being used for travel, they're in the delta configuration. And when only one is being used for travel, it's in the omicron configuration. As the intensity of the gravitational field around the disk increases, the distortion of space-time around the disk also increases. And if you could see the space-time distortion, this is how it would look. As you can see, as the output of the gravitational field from the amplifiers becomes more intense, the form of space-time around the disk not only bends upward, but at maximum distortion actually folds over into almost a heart shape around the top of the disk. Now remember, this space-time distortion is taking place 360 degrees around the disk. So if you were looking at the disk from the top, the space-time distortion would be in the shape of a donut. When the gravitational field around the disk is so intense that the space-time distortion around the disk achieves maximum distortion and is folded up into this heart-shaped form, the disk can't be seen from any vantage point and for all practical purposes is invisible. All you could see would be the sky surrounding it. The program out at Area S4 consisted of three projects, Project Galileo, Project Sidekick, and Project Looking Glass. Project Galileo dealt with gravity propulsion and was the source of all the information you've learned in this first section. Project Sidekick dealt with a beam weapon that had a neutron source and was focused by a gravity lens. Project Looking Glass dealt with the physics of seeing back in time. Now I was not personally involved with the hardware of Project Sidekick or Looking Glass and those projects are beyond the scope of this video. So this brings us to the end of this first part in which I'm presenting to you as fact. At this point we begin our second part, which is the section that contains what I call excerpts from the government Bible. I call it that because as you can tell from part one, there's a small segment of the United States government that makes scientific and technological judgments from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. If the following information is true, the United States government also makes judgments on a historical, philosophical, and even theological level from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. These are excerpts from some of that information. As part of my indoctrination into the program at S4, I would randomly be taken into a small room which contained a table, a chair, and 120 or so briefings in blue folders. I'd be left there to read for varying amounts of time, usually about half an hour. These briefings contained a wide spectrum of information, mostly relating to aliens and alien technology. 
These reports appear to be an overview of alien information which can be used to brief scientists from any field about the scope of the whole project and not just their specific field of endeavor. The overview of Project Galileo was accurate. I read the overview and later witnessed evidence which proved it to be accurate. So it is possible that scientists involved with other projects could have seen evidence that these other overviews were also accurate, but I can't make that assertion. To me, these reports were simply words on paper. So to keep from saying allegedly and supposedly in every sentence, I'll relay this information to you as I read it, since I've already put this disclaimer on it. This technology that you've learned about thus far was brought here by some alien beings from the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 star system. These stars are located in the constellation of Reticulum, which can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, which means it has two stars, and is located approximately 30 light years from Earth. These beings are from Reticulum 4, which is the fourth planet out from Zeta Reticuli 2. This is the way star systems were referred to in these reports. They simply designate the name of the star and the number of planets from the nearest to the furthest from the star. For instance, our Sun was designated as Sol, and the Earth was referred to as Sol 3 because we're the third planet out from the Sun. A day on Reticulum 4 is 90 Earth hours long. The beings are 3 to 4 feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads with almond-shaped wraparound eyes. They have very slight nose, mouth, and ear positions and are hairless. Any dates in the information regarding these beings were written in a six-digit number which began with 1623. Since I had no idea what the six-digit number was for the present year, I had no way of calculating when these beings arrived, or at least arrived this time. These beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and presented photographic evidence which they contended was over 10,000 years old. There was an exchange of hardware and information in Central Nevada until 1979, at which time there was a conflict which brought the program to an abrupt halt. The beings left, but were to return at a 1623 date, and I don't know what that date is. With the remaining hardware and information, the U.S. government started the back engineering program. In May of 1987, some scientists took an antimatter reactor to an underground blast facility on the Nevada test site to perform an experiment. Unfortunately for them, their experiment required them to cut the reactor open, which resulted in their deaths. This explosion was explained to others at the test site as a previously unannounced low-yield underground nuke test. I was hired in December of 1988 to replace one of these men. These beings conveyed information about the capability of affecting the human brain to anesthetize the human body. This is done without any physical contact from a remote source. For this anesthesia to be accomplished, the brain has to be in a relaxed state similar to that required for hypnosis. If the brain is subject to any external stimulation like stimulant drugs or loud music, this manipulation of the nervous system is ineffective. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man, as a species, had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we're containers of. As I'm sure you now know, it was impossible for me to corroborate the information in the second section. And obviously, if this information is true, the ramifications are far-reaching, and you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to figure that out. So before I bring this to an end, there are a couple of questions I should address for you. The first one is, how did I get into this program? While working at Los Alamos National Lab in 1982, the local newspaper did a front-page story on a jet car I had built. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was giving a speech in Los Alamos that same day. We met and had a short chat about the jet car, and I later listened to his speech. I never met Dr. Teller again, but in 1988, when I decided to re-enter the scientific community, I sent him a resume and inquired about a job. Dr. Teller responded by telephone and told me that he was no longer active, but just functioned in a consultant capacity. He gave me the name of a contact to call in Las Vegas. I made that call and things progressed from there until I got into the program. I never got a chance to ask Dr. Teller if he remembered me from Los Alamos, so I don't know if that was a factor or not. If you use nuclear fuel and not definitely possible, nuclear fuel is feasible, but whether these eventually velocities are feasible, which are interesting if you ever want to get the other stuff, that is an important. And that's about all I can say, all I have time to say. And what specifically the fuel will be, I think it might be fission, more probably fusion. And it 
Вот как все. Is there any other nuclear reaction besides fission and fusion that you know of? No. Is there anything such as... Look, please, you try to explore the things about which I only will have to tell you. It is not interesting. It's a waste of time. Above plutonium or uranium? Look, it is, in my opinion, not interesting. I don't intend to answer it. If you ask me that question on camera, I will shut up. I will sit silent. You are not going to get an answer out of me on that. Okay. And if I ask you on camera if you know Bob Lazar, can you just say no? I will sit silently. The second question is, that if all I have just presented to you is true and the government is keeping this a secret, how can I make a video telling you about it? Well, the bottom line is, if there are any repercussions from making this video, it would simply confirm that what I told you is true. So what you do with this information is up to you. Remember, not everyone who sees a disk in the sky is crazy. So keep your eye on the sky, especially here in central Nevada. And thanks for listening. Thank you.